BioBalance HealthCast Episode 161, The Affordable Care Act's Impact on Medical Doctors. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week, uh, Kathy and I are going to be talking about the Affordable Care Act. There has been so much in the news about it. It's such a controversial topic, politically, economically, medically, so on, that we thought we would weigh in with our contribution uh, to trying to make sense out of a conversation that needs to be had. Not that we have a specific answer that we would suggest on any part some. of it, but, but we're <laughs> passionately committed to the importance of having conversations about difficult issues. You know, the, the idea that there's a politically correct thing to say and an incorrect thing that you shouldn't say isn't helpful when we start trying to solve these problems. Mm -mm. So when, when Kathy and I sit down and talk about these things, uh, we range far afield and, and it's a pretty wide ranging and, and fast conversation. And so we, we thought we would try to pull that together in a, in a conversation that had a frame. Uh, to see if it would make sense to those of you who, who watch our show. And so the frame that we're originally going to try to impose is to say, let's try to look globally. Rather than chasing rainbows of, of specific facts that are arguable, oh, this will happen or that will happen, mm -hmm. the other will happen, let's, let's talk about how do we have a conversation in this country about medical care, how it's delivered, how it's paid for, who provides it, who regulates it, who controls it, and so on. And, and when we started trying to have that conversation, I said, Kathy, I don't know that we can isolate it to just medical care. Sometimes you have to look at a, a broader, you, you have to look at the whole chessboard. You can't mm -hmm. just look at one square. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, I think we have to look at the chessboard of how we fund our government and how our government pays for the things that it pays for. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask ourselves, is this the way we want to be spending our money? It's like a family budget. Right, uh, you know. but, it, but their budget, they can always make more money. But having said that, I mean, I can't, my family, can no, you? No, you I mean, can't just go print money. So you actually have to have a budget and the budget actually has to be specific. And but our, our prayer is that there is hopeful and intelligent thought behind the distribution of revenues as well as behind the collection of revenues. Right. And so when you say, well, how do we spend money in this country? One, one of my mm -hmm. pet issues is the whole drug war. Yeah, you know, that, I that we spend that. billions of dollars on the drug war to say that people can't smoke marijuana. And we're spending, uh, for, for nonviolent crimes, we're spending in the state of Missouri, which is where we live, $35,000 a year to keep a man incarcerated. And we have him incarcerated because he was selling marijuana for 15 years. I'd rather take that $35,000 and pay it not on keeping him in prison, pay some portion of it to send him to rehab, send him to treatment, get him mm -hmm. better in terms of his own consumption issues, but spend the rest of it on medical care for people mm -hmm. that, that have pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so can we... Can we focus a conversation on, is there a better way to spend the existing money that's being spent? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know the answer There's, to that. I look at it like the scales. Yeah. We, if, if and when the, the Affordable Care Act, which is just a misnomer, uh, comes in. Because it's unaffordable. Because it's unaffordable. But when it comes into um, play, you're going to have to spend money. Right. And you have to make money to spend. I mean, it's just like anything else. If I want to buy something big, I have to find a way to make more money outside of my budget to pay for that. Right, because you, you, one of the phrases you throw out is reverse budgeting. If, if the Affordable Care Act, with its mandates, comes online and it's out there, one of the things that it's going to say, as I understand it, is that health care providers have to provide uh, preemptive care. Uh, to, to you mean preventive, preventive care, preventive to, to care? help people get tests and to know if they need to lose weight or to get a flu shot or, or whatever, that there are going to be mandated things that they must do, just like mm -hmm. there are mandated things for uh, electronic data exchange and HIPAA. 
Uh, I mean, they're not part of the Affordable Care Act, but they're no. part of mandates that are made on doctor's okay, offices. First is care. Right. They're going to mandate certain things for care, and all that care costs money. Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is above and beyond what we spend with our insurance mm -hmm. anyway. So basically, we've got this lump sum that we're going to have to spend, but we don't have that much money. Right. We aren't getting that much money in taxes. So how are we going to do that? We're going to be right. insuring more people, supposedly at a lower cost. Therefore, if that's the case, our tax dollars are going to pay for it. So where do, where do we get the money that's going to pay for all of these new things right. and more people in, in the pot? So what they've done in the past, let's just look at Medicare. Medicare has said, okay, every year the number of people insured by Medicare gets bigger and the number of people paying for Medicare gets smaller because we all had smaller families. More people are in the elderly pool that receive Medicare right. and the people working pay for it. So Medicare has a certain budget. More people come in, they say, oh, we're going to pay less for each service. That because they, this is these, all the money we this have. This is all the money we've got. So instead of having 100 people sharing, we've got 1,000 people sharing, so everybody gets less. So everybody gets less, and the first people they cut it from are the doctors, then they mm -hmm. cut it from the hospitals, then they cut it from pharmacies, then they, but they cut it, and there's only so much you can cut. Mm -hmm. Because if you continue to do this, people, doctors will stop taking Medicare. Okay, and they have that option. And they have that option, and it is something that they do to survive. Not because they don't like old people, because right. we are old people, but because they can't pay their bills mm -hmm. to run their own practice when they get so little. Now it's like, I don't know, 10 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's income has gone down. But in the meantime, that's what the doctors are dealing with. In the meantime, the government also says... Not only do you have to take care of more people at a lower cost, you actually have to pay for EMRs, which is electronic medical records, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars for each practice. Every six months, they come up with a new HIPAA rule that you have to change your whole office for, which when you do that, that's more money. And they come in with CLIA rules if you have a lab in your office then you have to pay more money for that. So every time they give a new rule to a doctor's office, it takes less out of profit. And most doctors are getting down to the point where they're not paying themselves. So even if you run the most economically efficient, efficient operation, the fact that the regulations keep coming in that require you to spend more money just to meet the regulation, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily, I mean, having electronic records, the idea is a great idea, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help me get over my influenza. If no, I'm coming it has to nothing you. to do with care. So it's not care for me. And but they it's said cost it was going to save you. us, and it all it did is cost us. It's, mm -hmm. it's still costing the doctors that have this, that have to have a medical record. I don't take any um, insurance, and mm -hmm. I don't take, and mm -hmm. I, I, I have a practice that isn't paid for by any uh, insurance, Medicare, or anything. Well, I did so, as well. I mean, and one of the reasons that we quit taking insurance payments and went to a cash basis mm -hmm. system is the insurance companies said to us, everything now has to be electronic. If it's not electronic, mm -hmm. we won't pay it. So right. you have to be wired into our system. You have to have a computer. And, and then it would have cost you more than you made to do that. It would have cost a lot. And, and it not only would cost a lot for the insurance company and the mm -hmm. record keeping, but for the credit card company. Mm -hmm. Because in order to accept credit card payments, then you have to certify that your systems are secure, mm -hmm. and you have to have somebody come in and investigate, you know, can, can somebody break in and, and access your records right. and send that data out somewhere? Can somebody hack mm -hmm. your computers? What levels of restrictions do you have? What secret codes on the file cabinets do you have? Mm -hmm. Are these records kept separate from those? That's that's a huge cost yeah and then if you don't do that then you don't get insurance payments or and, you don't and get it's the law Medicare of unintended payments. consequences the the global idea electronic medical records following you around the world with instantly available it's a great idea it's a great idea but the implementation cost of that and the regulatory costs of that weren't factored in it, it doesn't work either because no, they didn't figure out see this is why it's important to figure out your plan before you do it mm -hmm. they didn't figure out to have how to make every um emr talk to each other right they don't even talk to each other so you have your medical records here and if some here and some here you change doctors over here but they don't all get compiled into one thing you still have to put it in when you go to a new doctor
Well, so it's not saving you time the, or anything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the doctor's office and they hand you the clipboard and say, fill this stuff out. And it's, it's already in your computer. Well, mm -hmm. fill it out again because my computer won't read it. You know, Or you have to fill out something on a computer or a kiosk right. to do that. So that's, that's huge, a huge cost that they didn't figure out. I would ask the government to figure out how they're going to pay the doctors to do everything they ask them to do. Because if it's a governmental thing and the government wants us to do it, then we should be paid to do that. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I mean, I, not that I want costs of medicine to go up, but you can't just keep taking money out of the medical practices because soon there'll be no doctors. Why would you work for nothing? Right. And I know some gynecologists that are working this whole year to make less than anybody would, would make it at uh, minimum wage. And, and, they, and they have all the liability issues. Oh, yeah. And you know, so, somebody and wants to sue them. The Affordable Care Act doesn't change the liability. It doesn't say, oh, you don't have to pay your medical malpractice insurance mm -hmm. because the government's going to pay it. So that in socialized medicine in other countries that they keep trying to tr well, trying to compare us to, they pay for the doctor's education. I remember. They also pay for them to live while they're being educated. Mm -hmm. Then they also don't have a legal system that has that no one has a recourse if they have malpractice. Mm. Basically, you don't have, the doctor doesn't have to pay that either. The government covers that too. Mm. So everything's covered by, by the government. You can't just come in and after a doctor spent $250,000 to be educated and didn't work for four years, you so, can't just say, oh yeah, we're gonna take away your income. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things, does that make sense? It does make sense. It's a real challenge to, to our framing question. How do we have a conversation because there are, there are passionately invested individuals who are shouting across the media on all sides of this conversation. And, and as a provider, as a consumer, as a citizen, how do I make sense out of all that and navigate my way through uh, if I'm a provider, mm -hmm. if I'm a citizen? It, it, I admit I've I, not read this one. Yeah. I read well, Senate Bill 959. My understanding the legislature that yeah. passed it. I mean, I've not read this. This is all from... Uh, interpretations from the media, the media, and the magazines and professional journals. Yeah, and so the journals on. that the I get are always the have. People the sky falling. The sky is falling. Yeah, but, but, but they're, doctors are people who look for answers, just like you. Right. I mean, counselors, doctors. We are people who are problem solvers. To be in office, that does not mean you're a problem solver. And we are filled with with a an executive office and a, a Senate and House that are not problem solvers. They just, they just know, we like need my, this. My father's, one of his favorite phrases was, I don't get headaches, I give them. I think the Congress is, That's, is like that sometimes. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I, have, I have to admit, I've never done their job. Yeah. But I would never. But they haven't done your job. They either. haven't done there aren't my that many job. many doctors and who I are would, in the Congress. I would there never assume to tell them how to do their job. Right. But, I, well, but they are telling me exactly to the minute level how to be a doctor and how to run a business but you can't just keep going to that well and taking money out of it because you want a big idea okay so so if i'm hearing you accurately part of what you're saying is the current system or the the system that as you understand it as it's being explained to you in order to accommodate the increased volume of patients on the same limited budget mm -hmm. has to make decisions about squeezing somewhere right and the squeeze place where that's happening most is in the amount of the pie that goes directly to the physician right or the radiology department or the hospitals okay so if those pieces get squeezed dry then they have to squeeze somewhere else or they, they have to adjust or then they start taking else. away from the patient, but there won't be any doctors. So mm -hmm. then doctors don't have to be doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors, you know, to be a doctor, or you have currently to they don't have to be doctors who accept Medicare. Will right. they have to be doctors that accept the Affordable Care Act? Will they sign up for those plans to say, sure, we'll we'll you have to that. though if you want to have an insurance. If you want to take an insurance plan, mm -hmm. then you have to take the ACA. So it may become like it is in, in England where they have a dual system. They mm -hmm. have national health care that's all one payer system, but then they also have uh, boutique practices. Above and beyond, above you pay, and beyond you pay where your you taxes. You pay cash. And you pay cash right. to have um, a doctor, another kind of insurance or doctors to take care of you there. Basically, when the doctors, 
but doctors work in both places. They work for for this social. I think this is how I understand it. They mm -hmm. work for the governmental me medicine, uh, and they do that a certain number of hours a week, and then they go to their private practices, and then they work Beyond there for that. cash. And so it's almost like a charity deal. Kind of like in Russia when they had collective farms, and they actually were growing more food on the little private plot that the farmers were allowed to have for their own personal mm -hmm. food, where all the collective farm food, the, the money for that went to the government. That's right. And, and what they discovered, and the reason their economy collapsed, is people were growing more food per acre on these little tiny plots than they were growing Because they the didn't have farms. a vested interest. They didn't have a vested and interest. I, and doctors are um, selfless in many areas, but when, when they've spent so much time and money, and they, they even, we even spent time like in high school not going to stuff and not doing things because we had to get great grades. You're so, the at-home study nerd? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you had to do that. So the things that you give up to actually get to be a doctor right. and then then you should be paid for the number of hours you work. And most doctors don't work 40-hour weeks. They work 80 or 90-hour mm -hmm. weeks. And that isn't, you don't get overtime. You don't, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like that. It's a profession. The problem here is that Doctors are going to choose to do different things, right. not medicine. Yeah, I went out to dinner with a physician friend of mine last week, and she was on call, mm -hmm. and she'd already worked a full day. Mm -hmm. And then at dinner, she got at dinner she got like three different calls that she had to excuse herself and take, deal with those patients' issues, make whatever uh, prescriptions or assignments she was going to make, mm -hmm. do the documentation on her cell phone for the right. electronic record keeping then come back to a cold dinner, and then get called away again. She was called mm -hmm. away three times at dinner. My, when in the first 15 years of practice, before I had the nurses help me with phone calls, mm -hmm. I would be awakened 30 times in a night. Yeah, I, that's and, and that's all, And then I worked a full day the next day. It's not like, you know, it's not like I did that's why you're crazy today. Yes, that's exactly why I'm crazy today. <laughs> actually, I feel better now because I've had three years of actually getting eight hours sleep, or close. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm not nearly as stressed or as well, crazy. But, but you had it, three years of getting eight hours of sleep because you gave up doing surgery, you mm -hmm. gave up doing uh, gynecological mm -hmm. care, uh, you gave up delivering babies, mm -hmm. uh, you gave up collecting insurance payments mm -hmm. and, and working in a medical office under all of these systemic regulations. Right. And you think more doctors are going to do that. That's true. I do. And, and find alternative pathways forward. Which just means that they may have an Affordable Care Act, but there's not going to be any doctors to take care of anybody, yeah. which is the way I view this as a huge problem. That When I looked at this problem, I viewed this. There are people who are very sick. There are people who really need care, and they have pre-existing conditions, right. and no insurance will cover them. Then there are people who get Medicare. There are people who have private insurance. They can pay for their insurance, or they can... Uh, or they can have insurance through their employer, and then there's Medicaid and the insurance for the poor. Okay, the only people we really need to t take care of, which would be a whole lot cheaper than spread, s making everybody do the same thing, are these very sick people, and they need us. Mm -hmm. They need the money. They need the money to take care of extraordinarily terrible illnesses. Yeah, I saw and something that said like 5% of the population consumes about 75% of the medical consumption. And that may be, but not 5% isn't uninsured. No, but I mean, but in terms of who's a lot sick of the enough for whatever reason. The Medicaid and there's a lot of Medicare that are very sick. But this is a very, it's not a big number compared to the population. Okay. They really need help right. and we're just going to give them the minimum amount of care just like everybody else we could have taken all that money left everything in place and actually given them the money from our tax dollars i, I don't think anybody would have an issue with that we wouldn't have had to redo the entire system for that mm -hmm. this is really needed and that's exactly i mean everybody else could get insurance and should and everybody in america should pay for their insurance if if they have their own business you know, you should have insurance. No one should be able to say, oh, I'm not going to get insurance. I'm going to let the hospital eat the bill. That should not be an a, a option. So Medicare, Medicaid, pay, let's pay for the sick people. We're already mm -hmm. paying some on Medicare and Medicaid from tax dollars. And then let it, the rest of everybody have their own insurance. But they have to have insurance. They can't go without it. Well, that's the mandate in the Affordable Care Act, is that right. everybody has to have insurance of some kind. Right, but they're not giving us a way for some of these sick people to get insurance. Right. 
and get real insurance, insurance that would really take care of them. I mean, people with MS, people who have uh, birth trauma, people, you know, well, so, little so kids you, so you on come respirators. Back to, again, trying to frame the conversation globally. There are things that are idealized in the Affordable Care Act that you support and embrace. Oh, the, yeah. The fact that people have portable medical insurance. So you don't have to stay at a job that you hate or that's dangerous for you mm -hmm. because you have a sick child that if you lost that job, you couldn't get that child covered with insurance. Right. So you ought to have portability. Absolutely. And, and you also are saying pre existing conditions. Uh, I remember having a client that was suicidal and I had a call for the approval of, of uh, services, and they said he's reached his cap. So there will be no services, but I still had the liability for and taking care still, of his suicidality. And he still had a life-threatening illness. And he had a life-threatening illness, but he was beyond what his policy coverage limits allow. And we'll see more and more of that. That and that will be part of the affordable care. So, I can, oh, you've reached your limit. See ya. So, well, the global concept is that it won't be. But your argument is if they don't There's not also enough money. talk about a way to pay for it, talk about a way to readjust the parameters so that those things are covered. The cool. issue is we're a democracy and we should be able to choose what insurance we get just like we choose going to Kmart or going to Saks. I mean, we should be able to choose how how well we're insured. So a free market economy. A free market economy is a better answer. Is a better answer. You just have <laughs> Part of the reason this isn't working mm -hmm. is because people can choose not to have insurance, and the insurance companies are taking so many billions of dollars out of the system that it's not between the patient and the to, doctor for anymore. For profit and management For costs. profit and management that we don't need, right. honestly. Right. So we need to get rid of all of these So levels. you're saying don't squeeze me, squeeze them. No, I'm saying they're making money for not doing medicine. They're not right. doctors, they're not nurses. Pay the nurses, pay the doctors, pay the nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. pay the people who are actually taking care of people, and then take out this, this oh no, you can't have that, no you can't. Well, medical that stuff is insurance companies are not very, in the business to provide medical care. They're they, in the business they pretend to make they are. I know. They're not health maintenance organizations, they're how much I can not do for you. Right. You know, How so I can, I can save reject. money. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the part that should have been adjusted. No one adjusted that part. And the people that really need insurance should be the ones that get the money from the government. Well, we need to take care of them. And so part of what you're saying conversationally, I mean, because this is reality, it is the law, and we're going to have to deal with it. And so adjustments are going to be made. It hasn't been. It's still under, it's still under construction right now. It's changed all the time. And, and so your argument is there still need to be conversations about how to honestly look at cause and effect, cost and benefit, mm -hmm. and make sensible decisions. And not just bureaucratic, arbitrary rulings of one kind. And not, I'm not going to negotiate about this. Everything's right. a negotiation. Okay. So you should have so, both sides n negotiating and have some viable plan, a real plan, not a, oh, let's just, you know, kumbaya, kumbaya yeah. it's all going to be fine, and not worry about the expense. None of us in our, in, just think, when you look at your budget for the year, you don't go, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to just buy everything I can possibly buy and pray that the money will be there. That doesn't, that's not a budget. Of course, it's how I operated for years, but it's not a budget. <laughs> and a country can't operate like that without getting in trouble. I believe. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, to me, they should actually have practical answers for everything or practical plans for everything they suggest. Don't pass anything without a plan. And the plan has to have monetary, actual monetary answers. How are we going to pay for this plan? That's my, that's Washington help. <laughs> we, need, we need some real answers, not, I mean, look at what we've suggested. Stu yeah. Stuff that we've suggested actually so the fundamental reality of life sense. is you've got to pay for what you get. Right. There's some no free lunch. And as citizens in a democracy, we need to be involved in the conversation about how do we pay for this? What do we pay for? Who makes the decisions? And so as this conversation continues to unfold nationally, our message to you is try to be informed, try to communicate with your legislators, uh, and for you and your family, try to make the best decisions that you can make. And consider, consider the cost and realize that in any democracy we have to take care of people who are too weak to care for themselves. And that's 
That's we need that. At we don't want to throw that those out. Those are the kind of people that you and I want us to be. There are others who would disagree, but that's what we're advocating. That's for. yeah, because we're we're caretakers. That's what we yeah. do. So we're just want to leave that on the table as a need. Yeah. And we yeah. don't want to deny care. So we're not going to be inviting Sarah Palin to come to our conversation <laughs> and talk about death panels. No. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.